2 Corinthians chapter 5. Today we're going to talk about death. We're all going to die. I hate to break it to you. Um, we're all going to die. That is part of life in a, in a fallen world. Either one of two things will happen. Either you will die or Christ will come back before you die. And you will get to miss death. But every single person that is... How do I say this? Every single person that misses the return of Christ, or if Christ does not come back in our lifetimes, we will die. But praise God that that is not the end of life for believers. That is not the end of life for believers. We will live forever with Jesus. We're going to talk more about that today. I want us to read our text, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5, and then we'll jump into that. But before we do any of that, I want to say a prayer for us. And then we'll read God's word together. Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you that you have preserved your word for all this time so that we have a guide to our believing, to our living, to our understanding of you and who you are. Lord, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit who dwells in every believer and leads us into all truth, who illuminates your word to us and shows us what is true. Lord, we ask this morning that your word, in conjunction with your spirit, would teach us today that we would not leave as we came, that you would change us, that you would make us more like you, that you would fill us with hope and with joy and with confidence, knowing that there will be a day when this world will end and a new, better one will take its place. Lord, we love you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. Uh Uh-oh. 2 Corinthians, I'm going to silence my phone. (laughs) 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. Let me read this for us. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So here's the sequence of events for believers. Our bodies die. That that is a part of life in a fallen world. It was not originally God's intention that man would die. Adam and Eve were made in a way that they would not die. But you and I, because of the curse of sin... God promised them that in the day that they disobeyed him, they would die, and they disobeyed him. And by God's mercy, he didn't kill them immediately, but death came into the world, the Bible says, and death has reigned. And we all experience death all the time. We are all dying, and eventually, unless Christ comes back first, like I said, we will all die. Here's 2 Corinthians 4.16. He says, our outer self is wasting away. We talked about this last time. Yet our inner self is being renewed day by day. So we all will die. Our bodies are decaying on earth, or they will decay. So we die and we we go in the ground, and yet we are not just our bodies. So our, our bodies go in the ground, and our spirits go to be with the Lord. So 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we'll get into this more next week, but he says, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So the Apostle Paul immediately dismisses any idea that your spirit goes with your body into the ground. He says, if we're away from the body, if our bodies die, our spirit's going to be with the Lord. But that's not the end either. That's not the end either. That is not ideal. There's something broken about a body and a soul being separate. There's something broken about that. And so God promises us something greater, that we will rise again, that we will be with Jesus, not just in heaven, not just as a spirit, but with him on the new heavens and the new earth in a physical body, a resurrected, perfected body. 
And that tells us a couple of things, that we're more than just souls as well. I think a lot of us, or at least I used to think this way, when I die, my soul goes to heaven, and that's it. We'll just call it a day, I get to be with God. But that's not it. We will go to heaven immediately to be with him. And yet, we see in Revelation that there are martyrs around the throne of God, those who have been killed for their faith, who are constantly praising him and also asking, how long, O Lord, until you avenge our bodies? So that, that even to be in heaven with God after we die is not a perfect state. God is perfect. He's there. Our souls are then perfected, and yet we're still waiting for something more. And our bodies were not, like I said, meant to be temporary. God made human beings as body and soul, and so we'll be reunited with new glorified bodies, and that's what I want us to talk about today. We're going to talk about our new glorified bodies, our hope of heaven. So when we say, hey, I'm going to heaven when I die, when I say that, I'm not meaning I'm going to go float on a cloud somewhere. I'm meaning that I'll go to be with God, but then I'm going to be in heaven with God, the new heaven, the new earth, when heaven meets earth and God brings his kingdom to this world and makes all things new. That's what I'm looking forward to. So here's the main idea today. Main idea, first blank. Every Christian, every Christian will receive a glorious resurrection body after this life. So that one again. Every Christian will receive a glorious resurrection body after this life. Praise God, this is not the end for us. A couple of things that come out of this truth. A couple of things that he outlines here. This is the main thought, but these things surround it. Here's the first one. Human beings are more than physical bodies, but not less. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So human beings are more than physical bodies, but not less than physical bodies. And I love the way that he, he talks about our bodies. He uses several different words, actually. He calls it our tent, our house, our home, our dwelling. That, in other words, our spirit now lives, <clears throat> excuse me, in a body. <clears throat> and we are a spirit and a body together. That's what makes a human being a human being. If we were just a body, we'd be robots. If we were just a spirit... We couldn't interact with the physical world. But as it is, God makes us a body with a spirit inside it. And so Paul can talk about our spiritual, or our tent, our home, our dwelling. And he's not talking about our houses, he's talking about our bodies. And yet he can also say that we're more than our bodies because he says if our bodies are destroyed, then we get to go and be with the Lord. If this tent that is our current home is destroyed, then God is going to give us a new one. Which means that when your body dies, you don't die with it. When your body dies, you don't die with it. You are more than your body, but you're not less than your body. So that we can say, hey, Sherry is here today. Jake is here. Leslie is here. We're not just saying their bodies are here, but you as a person, you're here because you, your body is a part of you. Okay? So we are more than our physical bodies, but we're not less than. Now, this, uh, this also points to the truth that the world looks at us and says, no, you're just a body. When you die, what do you do? You go in the ground, and that's it for you. When your body dies, you die. But the Bible says, no, we are more than our bodies. Here's the second idea. We'll spend more time on this one. Number two, the bodies we have now are, A, they will not last forever. The bodies we have now, A, will not last forever. They just won't. Like I said, we are in these bodies now. Paul says, if this tent is destroyed, and what he's meaning is, unless Christ comes back, this tent will be destroyed. It's just a matter of time. Our bodies wear out. They get mileage and things break. Now, again, this does not have to be the case. That came in because of the judgment of God on sin. Death reigns because of sin. They say, those who study our bodies now, scientists, that our, um, our cells have programmed into them to stop reproducing eventually. That they reach a point where we die. Like this, this cell is no longer functioning. It just dies. And that that doesn't have to be in there. That that's not somehow integral to the cell working. 
that it's there, though. And scientists hope that they can undo that by science. I don't know that they'll be able to because death is a part of God's judgment. God put that in there because of sin. Now, in a sense, that kind of, it is judgment, but it's also a blessing to us. Who wants to live forever in a broken, fallen, sinful world? That is a curse and not a blessing. It seems like, yeah, man, to live forever in this world would be great, but it wouldn't be. Maybe you know people that as they get older and older and they see more and more suffering and pain and and sorrow in their lives, they just become more and more bitter and mean and hateful. And even us who have the Spirit of God in us would continue to be burdened, and we'll talk about this here in a second, because it is not a blessing to live forever in this fallen world. Paul also says in verse 4, talking about our bodies that will not last forever, that what we have is mortal. Our bodies are mortal. And what that means is that they're given over to death. It's the opposite of immortal, which means undying. So the bodies we have now will not last forever. Here's B. The bodies that we have now cause us to groan. They cause us to groan. Sometimes inwardly and sometimes like actual physical groaning. Maybe you've experienced that where you you go to bed, you're feeling good. You wake up in the morning, you put those first foot on the ground and you're like, Oh, goodness gracious, my foot hurts this morning. Why? And you physically groan. Or maybe it's just an inward groaning where you you feel the pain maybe or you are just not as quick as you used to be. Either way, you you groan. Here's, Here's two reasons why in this passage that we groan. The first one is because we know that a far better body is waiting for us. We know that a far better body is waiting for us. That's the little eye underneath there. Our bodies now cause us to groan because we know that a better body is waiting. Verse 2 says, In this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. And I think what he's getting at is a couple of things. One is that we, we, when we groan in this life, when we, when we see the decay, when we feel it, it causes us to look forward to a day that God has put in our hearts, that there will be a day when we will put on a better, perfected, glorious body. And so part of us, deep in our spirits, just recognizes that. And so we're like, man, I, I want, I'm waiting for that. But then also that here we are now in this body, and we want that better thing. We want that to be now, and so in the meantime, we groan. But look what 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 57 says. It says, this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that there's a sense that when we come into Christ, and we're still in these physical bodies, and our inner self is being renewed, and our outer self is wasting away, that we groan because now we're looking forward to that day. And we say, how long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? So we groan because a far better body is waiting for us. Think about this with me. There will be a day when you won't wake up sore. There will be a day when You don't have to think about the medicines that you have to take. You won't have to think about, well, can I go outside today? Is the pollen count too high? Or uh, am I going to be in pain today? That all of the things in your body one day in Christ, in our new resurrection bodies, will be perfect. Everything will work the way it's supposed to. Or you won't have to look in the mirror and say, man, what happened, right? (laughs) Ten years ago, I used to be so much more handsome. Maybe you don't have that thought. Or, wow, I definitely gained 70 pounds. What happened? How did that happen to me? Because in heaven, that won't be the case. You will be in a perfected body. It will not be a burden to you. You won't have to groan anymore. But now we groan because we're looking forward to it. Here's the second thing. I, I, we groan because we're weighed down by a decaying body. So in the one sense, we groan because we're looking forward to, to the better thing. But we also groan because... 
Today I'm in this decaying body. So number two, we are weighed down by a decaying body. Paul says in verse four again, while we're still in this tent, we groan being burdened. He says we're being burdened. The idea there is that there's a heavy weight on us. I love this illustration of of the Roman soldier. They say, and I think this is true, if not, it's a great legend, but that in the Roman army, if you killed someone, like if you committed murder against one of your fellow soldiers, you wouldn't just be killed. They would chain his dead body onto you. Imagine that with me. You kill someone, and so rather than saying, you know, you have to die now, they say, all right, we're going to chain his dead body to your back so that you would carry around this man that you've killed on your back as his body decays. It's a, it's a vivid picture. And yet Paul says that here we are in these bodies of death. This is kind of the idea that in Christ we have put to death the old man and yet he's still chained to us. Like our physical selves, we're still bound up in this world. We still have the desires of the flesh. We still have the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And we still have all of these temptations, all of these things in a spiritual sense, but also in a physical sense where our bodies are just, they're not going to last forever. Today, you will not be as strong and as fast as you were yesterday. And that will continue to march onward. And so we're burdened. So there will become things for all of us that, hey, I really would like to do this for God or for the good of other people, and I just can't. And that we feel the weight, we're weighed down, and so we groan. We groan. And groaning is completely acceptable. Let me say that. It's not wrong to groan. Now, there's a difference between complaining against God and groaning. You can complain against God and say, God, why are you doing this? But the truth is, that's not helpful and it's not right either. But when we groan, we can groan as we long, as we feel the weight down, the, the weight on our shoulders of this decaying body. It's okay to groan. To be like, man, I wish this wasn't the way that it was. I wish the world wasn't broken by sin. I wish that I was with Christ already. That's okay. That's the groaning he's talking about here. Or here's number three. Here's number three. And there's three things underneath this one. So here's the first one. Our resurrection bodies are from God. So that, we talked about our our current bodies. Here's our resurrection bodies. They're from God. That's the first thing. They're from God. Verse 1, he says, we have a building from God. If this tent is dismantled or destroyed, we have a building from God. And that's great for a couple of reasons. This building that comes from God can't be destroyed again. That's the first idea there. It can't be destroyed again. If God gives you something and it's from God, especially our resurrection bodies, there's not going to be another time of death. These bodies are going to be unbreakable. But also it means that our hope is sure. That when when we look forward to the bodies that are coming to us, when we we shed this mortal coil, as they say, we're going to have a a promise from God that we will have a resurrection body, a new body from God. Here's B. Our resurrection bodies are eternal. They're eternal. They're going to last forever. There's going to be no wearing out. There's going to be no breakdown. So not only will we not die again, but we also won't decay again. All the things in your body now that cause you to groan, the broken things, the temptations, the urges, the pains, whatever it may be, those things will be gone, and now this body will be eternal. It will literally last forever. Here's verses 3 and 4. He says this strange phrase. He says, we long to, to, be, to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked, but be further clothed. Be further clothed. So we're not, like I said, we're not going to be spirits just floating around in, in eternity. We're going to be further clothed. This is the idea he's, he's getting at. So I think he's directly attacking the idea that we would shed our bodies and now, oh, like to be a free spirit. He says, that's not good. That would be like being naked. Your spirit would be naked. And in Paul's idea, or excuse me, not just Paul's idea, but in the, in the Jewish system that Paul came from, in his mind, being naked was a deeply shameful thing. 
It was wrong to be naked because of sin, because of the garden, because they were naked and unashamed, and they sinned, and they were able to see the shame of one another, and so they covered their nakedness. And so for him to say, no, we're not going to be found naked, he's kind of, I think, assuaging his own fear. He's saying, hey, don't worry about that. Don't worry about it. We're not going to be naked. We're going to be further clothed, something better. So instead of shedding our bodies, we're going to put on a new body. There was also this idea going on in Greece at the time that it was bad to be material, that matter was evil and spirit was good, and that the creation of the world happened because of kind of a cosmic accident where matter and spirit collided and that that was not a good thing, and so that one day those things were going to be separated out again and everybody was just going to be spirit, and that would be the ideal. Paul says that's not the ideal. That's not right. Spirit and material things are both good because God made them both, and so they are both good. So he says, we're not going to be naked. We're not just going to be spirits. We're going to put on. We're going to be further clothed with a new body that what is mortal may be swallowed up with life. That we would be swallowed up with life. So not only are we going to have eternal physical bodies, but we're going to be able to live forever in these bodies. When Jesus promises us eternal life, he means it. He means it. And it's not saying we won't die. What he's saying is we won't die for good. We will ultimately live forever. John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So we will have bodies that are eternal. Here's C. Our he- resurrection bodies are heavenly. They're heavenly. And I put that in quotes because heavenly can mean a bunch of different things. But they're heavenly. Literally, they're of heaven. That's what the, the words say in the Bible. They're of heaven. They will not be of earth. That's the idea, the contrast here. So that our heavenly bodies will come from heaven. And so they won't be bodies from earth. They will be better they will be good. We will be like Christ is now in his resurrection body. Again, verse 1, not made with hands, Paul says. Here's 1 Corinthians 15, 40, talking about our resurrection bodies. If you're interested more in resurrection, I encourage you to go read 1 Corinthians 15. He talks all about that there. He says this in verse 40, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another so in other words, part of being having this heavenly body from heaven or of heaven is that it's going to be glorious. Like I said, you're going to look in the mirror and not be discouraged anymore. There's going to be nothing to pick out. It'll be glorious. And other people will see you with the glory of Christ all over you. Here's 1 Corinthians 15, 48 through 49, a few verses later. He says, as was the man of dust, talking about Adam, so also are those who are of the dust, which is all of us. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So that we're going to, there's two senses in which we're being transformed into the image of God or the image of Christ. One is the, the material, or excuse me, the, the spiritual sense where we are being made more like him in our character, in our desires, in our goodness, all of these things. But then there's also the the physical sense in which right now we're decaying, but we will one day look like him, not necessarily like his face, have the same face, but that we will have a glorious resurrection body like Christ, that he will be the firstborn among many brothers, the Bible says. So our resurrection bodies are going to be from God, they're going to last forever, and they're going to be heavenly, they're going to be glorious. Here's the fourth idea. Big number four, Christians can have full assurance that we will live again forever because of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. I'll say that one again. Christians can have full assurance. We can be totally sure that we will live again forever because of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Notice how he starts the passage in verse one. He says, for we know that if this tent is destroyed, we have, a, we have a heavenly dwelling. He says, we know. 
This is not a thing that we're hoping is true or that, well, I really, it would be great if this was true or we're rolling the dice. He says, we know. We know. This is not just wishful thinking. I think a lot of people think of Christianity as well. Here's these sweet, stupid, deluded people who have convinced themselves that, you know, everything is going to be better in another life. But Paul says, no, we know that this is true. We're not just playing a game here. We're not, this is not just some kind of thing where we all pretend with each other that this is true and we just kind of encourage each other to play pretend. No, no, no. We know that this is true, that we will live forever because of the Spirit is what he says later on. At the end in verse 5, he says that God has put his Spirit in us. He's given us his Spirit as a guarantee, as a, a down payment, of a, as a surety of what's going what's gonna to come. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. I just said, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Now, this is not, like I said, this is a, a down payment, not a, not a promise. This is a down payment. The reason you give a down payment is to guarantee someone that you will pay them the full amount, right? You have somebody come do work for you. You say, hey, I'll give you, you know, 20% up front or maybe half up front, depending on what it is. And you give them that so that they know, hey, you actually have the money to pay me at the end. And then they can work hard for you and not be concerned about whether or not they're getting paid. And in the same way, God gives us his spirit as a guarantee. Look, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 says this, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee, same exact word, of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So God gives us his spirit as a guarantee. So when we have the spirit in us, we know, hey, God's given us this spiritual down payment that he will also raise us from the dead. So how does this make us know? How, how, what, is the, what are we looking for that we have the spirit? Well, it's that God is changing us. We see God changing us, changing our hearts, changing our minds, changing the things we love, changing the things that we believe to be true getting us in line with the truth, giving us love for people that we didn't love before. All of these things, giving us the spiritual fruit that Paul talks about in Galatians 5, that we have these fruits of the Spirit. Not that we make ourselves have love and joy and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and all these things, but that because the Spirit is in us, those things start to come out of us so that we can look at our own lives and say, hey, I can know that I'm in Christ and that I will live again. In other words, as God is renovating the inside of your tent, your house, your, your body, then we can be confident that he will also renovate the outside. That's what Paul says in verse 16 of chapter 4 that we just read. We don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. So that even as our bodies are dying and we're like, man, I need that eternal life to kick in. <laughs> We can look inside and see, hey, it's happening already. God is making me new, and he will raise me with Christ. I'm not going to die when I die. All right, so what do we do because of this? What do we do because of these things? So one, I mean, not the true number one, really number zero, we have hope. This gives us a hope that we're going to live forever with him. But two things. Well, number one, because we will live forever, we should be courageous. We should be courageous. We're going to talk more about this next week. But verse 6, right after our passage, says, So we are always of good courage. We're always of good courage. Because we know, hey, I'm going to live forever. What is the worst thing that could happen? You die. And Paul says to live is Christ and to die is gain. So you're going to kill me? Great. Kill me. Let me go be with Jesus. That's not to say we have a death wish now or that we risk our lives unnecessarily, but we should be courageous because the worst case scenario is the best thing for us. We should be full of courage. We should face danger fearlessly. We should face evil fearlessly. We should do what is right knowing that if I die, I go to be with Jesus. It should make us courageous. Here's what 1 Corinthians 15, 58a says. And I pull this one because, in, like I said, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, he's talking about 
the resurrection. Here's the thought he ends with. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and immovable. In other words, if someone tries to come and tear you away from Christ, you can say, go ahead and try. I'm going to live forever. Here's number two. So we should be courageous, but also we should work hard for Jesus. Here's 1 Corinthians 15, 58b, the second half, says that we are always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So we have courage because we know even if I die, I'm going to live. But we work hard for Jesus knowing that because this life is not the end, what we're doing here is not a waste. The person who is an atheist, I don't know how they live. I don't, I don't know how you wake up in the morning and think, I am an accident of cosmic proportions. I am stardust accidentally collected into this body. My consciousness is an illusion. My life has no actual purpose. I'm playing a game. Let me go out and live my life today. I don't know how you do that. I, I think there's a reason that our, our world today is getting more and more, at least in the West, in America, people are more and more depressed, more and more anxious, more and more just walking around with a cloud over them because we have convinced ourselves there is no God and we threw God away. We lost any kind of hope and any kind of purpose. And so us who are believers, we don't work that way. I would, we can wake up in the morning and say, man, God is with me. God has given me an actual purpose. What I do today matters because this world is not going to last forever, but I'm going to last forever. And the things that I do for Christ will be established forever. That my work in the, in the Lord is not in vain. And so we, we work differently. And so that should motivate us to do things for Christ. And, and even the simple things we can do for Christ. The Bible says that we work unto the Lord and not for men. That whatever you do, you can turn your mind to Jesus, do it to worship and honor him, and it becomes something that is far beyond whatever it was. Whether you're sacking groceries or building buildings or doing ministry, it is all, it is all, it all can be done for Christ. And if it's done for Christ, it will last forever. So as believers who know we will live forever, we work differently, and we can work hard for Jesus. We're storing up heavenly treasure for ourselves that moth and rust cannot destroy. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your great love for us, that we get to be included in Christ, that by our faith alone, you welcome us into your family, that you take us who have earned death and through Jesus, give us life and everything else. Lord, for my brothers and sisters here who are in Jesus, I ask that you would fill them with courage, that you would fill them with hope, that you would fill them with joy and purpose, that they would be able to do all that they do for your sake, for your kingdom, knowing that in Christ nothing we do is in vain. Lord, fill us all with the hope that even if we die, we will live. Lord, if there's anyone here today who is questioning or who is unsure whether you exist, Lord, I ask that you would show them the reality that if you are not here, if you are not real, if you have not made the earth, that everything is completely meaningless. But that in you, everything gains a purpose. Lord, and if there's anyone stuck in the middle who believes in you, who has put their faith in Jesus to save them from their sins and yet is sinning or pursuing sin, who is feeling guilty for the things that they've done wrong, who knows that their lifestyle is dishonoring to you, Lord, I ask that you would remind them that they will live forever, that they are today building either on sand or on Christ. And that they would be filled with conviction, that they would be absolutely miserable in their sin. Lord, but that you would open their eyes to see what hope there is when they repent and put their sin behind them and run after you with all that they are. 
Lord, we are all in need of you today. And we are all grateful that we will live forever in Christ, that this life is not the end. So Lord, help us today to go and live for Christ. We love you. We ask all these things in his name. Amen.